One name alone has overcome His name, His life Our past defeated, our shame is gone He bears our secrets in His scars Our fears and failures overcome His name, His life Celebrate the name of Jesus Christ, and that's why we're here today. We want to give you a few updates, though. You'll direct your eyes to the screen, and Pastor will be with us here in just a second. Good morning. Welcome to Mercy Crossing. We're so glad you're here with us today. If you're a first-time visitor today, please take out the card in the seat in front of you. Fill it out. Take it to our foyer at the end of service and turn it into our first-time guest booth. We have a gift for you. For those of you that don't know who we are, I'm... I'm Pastor Roger, I'm your children's pastor here, and this is my wife, Melissa. Um, we're excited about the direction that Mercy Crossing has chosen through life groups. 
Uh, they're getting ready to start back up again in February, and uh, we're really excited um, for you to get plugged in and find a place you know where you can you can serve. Um, for us, we're starting a new parenting life group that will be on Tuesday evenings, and um, we'd love for you to be a part of our life group if you have kids or or planning to have kids. But get plugged into a life group because they really do matter. We have a baby dedication coming up on February 17th. If you have a baby or a child that's not been dedicated and you would like to have them dedicated that day, please contact the church office. We'd love to make room for you and your family on this very special day. And the last thing that we'd love to share with you today is if you're a part of our congregation and you're in the age bracket of 20s to 30s, uh, please contact Mark Stocks. He has uh, an exciting program that he's put together just for you and you're going to want to be a part of it. Mercy Crossing is a place to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Thank you for keeping in touch. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Didn't, didn't Roger and Melissa do a great job with Mercy Minute? Can't you tell their personalities? It is just so wonderful to watch them bring announcements. I was hoping Ben would do the blooper reel this morning, but maybe we'll get that done in a couple of weeks. Hey, it's good to have you in the house of the Lord. I'm glad it's not raining, snowing, sleeting, or heavy frost this morning. I hate all the above, and I'm glad, especially on Sunday, and I'm glad that you are in the house of the Lord, and you guys look good today, and you know the routine. This is what we love to do. It's so good when we come to the house of the Lord, and we're able to fellowship and greet one another and so that's what we're going to do just for a moment smile real pretty go ahead some of you need to practice that's it <clears throat> now with a good smile on your face step out from where you're standing go to two or three people say it is good to be in the house of the Lord today let's fellowship stopping what you plan you give us faith to move the mountains hope to dream again we see the fires of revival darkness giving way to light the glory of your grace advancing let it burn up the night let it burn up the night. Let the walls come down in Jesus' name. Let the lost be found in Jesus' name. Let the church arise to shine your light to the world. Shine your light. Your house forever undivided. Oh, sons and daughters one at the cross we are united our hope is in the blood
is rising as all your people seek your face your life a river flowing to wash a sin and shame away salvation's tide is rising as all me because I think about the potential of this church. I think about what God has given us. Look around for a moment. You guys are some of God's most choice people on earth, and God has equipped every one of you to reach someone for Christ. You know, we're hoping that uh, we see thousands come into this church, and we're believing that, and that's been prophesied over us. But what's most important is that we just reach somebody for Christ. If they don't come to mercy, it's okay. We want to we wanna fill this place. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping Pastor Knuckles has to build a church here. <laughs> I'm hoping he has to put stadium seating in the back of this auditorium. I believe it's going to happen. But, but I believe that we just need to reach out and, and in faith just thank God for souls that are going to be coming to this place. Can we close our eyes for a moment and do that? God, I pray that you will use these people, God, to reach the harvest. This harvest is all around us. It's in North Carolina. It's in Roanoke. It's in Danville. It's all over this region. And we ask, God, that you would use us to win somebody to your kingdom, God. Souls that are in the balance. Give us divine appointments in this place. I pray that this week coming up, divine appointments will fall in the path of your people, God, and that you will enable, to, enable us through the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will give us the words to say. God, when we, when we encounter that person, go ahead, Cam. Give us the words to say, Lord. And we will lift you above all men. We'll give you all glory. All the glory belongs to you, Lord. We will take no glory. We will sing hallelujah to your name. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun is dead. The Savior of the was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him we will give you glory 
you sing hallelujah when you sing hallelujah when you sing hallelujah the lamb has overcome we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb has overcome we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah. say that word with me hallelujah hallelujah I mean I want you to say it right out of your heart hallelujah hallelujah an expression of praise to him I've been in South Africa and I've heard that word hallelujah I've been in Roatan and I've heard that word hallelujah I've been in Korea and I've heard that word hallelujah oh hallelujah hallelujah to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world that heals our body and mends our broken heart the Lamb of God who has never failed us, who has never left us. Hallelujah. 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 I mean, I want you to say it like you mean it. I want you to raise your hands. And I want you to say hallelujah to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the name of the Lord. What a beautiful word, an expression of our praise and adoration to Jesus Christ. God bless you. You may be seated for just a moment. Our ushers are already here waiting to serve you. And uh, before they do that, we've been taking about 30 seconds, and we've been highlighting some of the ministries that take place here in our church. We've talked about those who work in sound and media and music and our young people. And uh, we, we just... 
We're so blessed. We have such an incredible pastoral team. Yesterday, I was with Pastor Wood, and I want to tell you what a blessing he is to this church. He is... He is a true ambassador for Jesus Christ in the truest sense of the word. I watched him perform a graveside service and make it so personal and so real and allow the Holy Spirit to use him. And he does such a marvelous job in visitation, visiting our hospitals, our nursing homes, performing funerals and everything that he has asked to do. And he is just a prince a chosen servant of the Lord. And I don't know about you, but the Bible says that we are to give honor to whom honor is due. Would you let him know how much you appreciate his ministry in this church? Amen. 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 Again, thank you for being in the house of the Lord today. I, I, we were able to have um, a service on Wednesday night because of the weather that took place on last Sunday morning. And I just want to reiterate how much I hate snow, ice, sleet, and rain on Sunday morning. And, and I know that sounds like I'm whining, but it, it, it probably really is in some way. But what it does, it, it slows down our momentum as a church, and it always affects us financially as a church because if we're not here, we don't have that opportunity to give. And we've been talking about, since the beginning of the year, purpose, giving on purpose. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, each of you, now listen carefully, look at me and listen. I know you're going, where's that dollar bill? I'm praying it's more than that said, each of you must give what you have decided, and the word there is purpose, what you have purposed in your heart, not with regret. It means that you're not giving because you give it and then you regret it like buyer's remorse. Or under compulsion, it doesn't mean that someone's up here with a 38 going, if you don't give this morning, bless God, I'm going to shoot each of you. All right? That's what it means. You're not, no one is forcing you to give. You should not give in regret. It says, you give since, since God loves a cheerful, hilarious giver. So the, it, giving, giving really doesn't start with your wallet. Hello. Giving starts with you purposing and determining in your heart what you are going to bring to the kingdom of God. Can I tell you, if you put God first in the purpose of giving, deciding that he is first, I will tell you that he will move heaven and earth to bless you. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to give this morning. And we purpose, Father, we have decided that we are coming to you out of a cheerful heart, knowing that you bless those who give cheerfully. And Father, I pray that you would bless your people, and I declare over this church, over this people, that your good hand is upon us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord. Stand with us again, please. Let's worship the Lord together. You are the word of the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. You're hidden.
let him know that you appreciate who he is and that you have access to him the veil was torn and now you can walk right into the holy of holies in the name and power and presence of Jesus Christ and we praise you Jesus we magnify you Lord we glorify you hallelujah 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 thank you Mark thank you praise team choir musicians what an awesome job to lead us into the presence of the Lord today. Amen. Would you let them know that? God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're in a series called You Ask For It. The first Sunday of this year, we talked about stress 
and we learn some ways that God helps us deal with those stressors and stress of our daily life. And then on Wednesday night, we talked about hope because you asked for it. When we passed out those little slips of paper, a lot of you said, I want to know more about hope. And uh, we looked at that subject on Wednesday night. I, I just want to share with you about next Sunday. I'm, I'm standing beside Sharon and I'm already anticipating what God is going to do next Sunday. We're going to be talking about healing healing. Many of you ask, would you share with us what the scripture says about healing? And I, I'm already sensing it's going to be a unique moment. And I'm, I'm really cautious. I really am so cautious to say, you know, the Lord said, but in my spirit, I'm sensing that it's going to be a really unique experience for us next Sunday as we talk about the healing power of God. As a matter of fact, I'm already planning to make sure that we pass out pieces of cloth. We call them prayer cloths. And um, there's a significance there that we'll share. But I, I believe that Sunday is going to be a wonderful time in the Lord. This morning, I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. And for a launching pad for what we're going to talk about, we're going to look at verse number 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to tell you what we're going to be talking about today. Ephesians 2, 10, Paul says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There, there's something I want to emphasize in this verse. We are his creation, his workmanship. One translation says we are his masterpiece. Today, we're going to have a little bit of fun with it. We're going to talk about identity crisis. Identity crisis. The cow is having one, and quite honestly, many of you are. So let's pray together and ask the Lord to touch us this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, that we're able to look into your word and find answers. And I'm asking that today that you would anoint me to be able to speak to your people, that they would understand what your word says about who they really are. And God, I give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Are, are you questioning who you are? Maybe you're questioning what your purpose is or what your values are. If so, you may be going through what some call an identity crisis. The term identity crisis first came from a developmental psychologist by the name of Eric Erickson. He introduced that concept of adolescent identity crisis and then later on he coined the term midlife crisis talking about the fact that we go through identity crisis. If you're experiencing an identity crisis, you may be questioning your sense of self-identity. This is, this is um, something that often arises out of times of major changes or lots of stress in your life. You may be turning a certain age and therefore you go through an identity crisis. You, you may be going to school and chasing a, a different occupation, a different um, uh, vocation, and that may create a, a, an identity crisis. There may be major changes that are going on in your life, and it creates an identity crisis. H having an identity crisis really isn't a diagnosable condition, and, and there aren't really common or typical symptoms, however, 
there are a few signs along the way that may suggest that you are indeed having an identity crisis. You, it may be occurring when you question who you are in regard to certain life aspects such as career, relationship, life choices. There may be conflict about your role in society. I've never seen so many identity crises in my life. People are mixed up about who they are physically, biologically, psychologically, sexually. T turn me up a little bit. I want everybody to hear me today. You, you can be experiencing an identity crisis if, if there are big changes in your life, such as going through a divorce. I've, I've often met with people after that traumatic experience, and they go, I don't even know who I am anymore. I was a wife. I was a husband. I was this or that. You, you may be going through an identity crisis because you've lost someone significantly to death, and all of a sudden you're going, who am I? You start to question your values, your beliefs, your spiritual experiences. You're searching for meaning and reason and passion for your life. And for a lot of people, this is a real situation. I know that it's funny at its, at its worst, but some people are really going through this. And, and we ask ourselves, while we're going through this identity crisis, how do we see ourselves? Can I ask you that? How do you see yourself? How do you feel about yourself? Well, where you have a tremendous impact on how far you go in life is how you see yourself, how you feel about yourself, and whether or not you're really going to fulfill the destiny that God has for you because the truth of the matter is you're never going to rise above the image that you have of yourself in your own mind, in your own heart, in your own personhood. There's been such a renewed interest in this issue of identity. Identity, self-awareness, self-esteem, self-concept, and self-worth. So let's talk about it because you ask for it. Although clinical psychologists enjoy dissecting the slight differences in the actual meaning of the words, when I use terms like self-concept or self-esteem or self-worth or true identity, we're going to sort of use them interchangeably. So let's begin with this question, who do you think you are? Look at your neighbor and say, who do you think you are? How, how do you regard yourself? What, what deep down feelings do you really, you see, most of us wear masks. Hello? Most of us really wear masks that hide the true identity of who we are. The mask of Sunday morning is that we typically put on something that's presentable. We brush our teeth. We comb our hair. You, you, you women put on makeup. You're not going to leave the house with makeup. I understand that. I don't, I don't know why, but you're going to get here. You're going to look your best because you're going to put that mask on, and someone's going to say, hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. Hallelujah. But on the inside of you, there's this sense that I'm, I'm, I'm not doing well. Deep down, there are feelings about yourself that should not reside in your spirit, your opinion or your judgment of yourself is actually destroying who you really need to be. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to continue to probe for just a moment. Do you really like yourself? When you look in the mirror, what do you see? You see, I know that there are young people who look in the mirror and they're thin as they can be and they, 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 the reflection points back that they're fat and overweight and they're not. Because of identity. If you were painting a portrait of yourself today, what would it look like if you had the capacity and the ability of an artist to paint the true self? What would that picture look like? Interesting, most of our self-image and our own identity may not be an accurate reflection of who we really are. Our perception of ourselves may not be who we really are. Let's go to the Old Testament just for a moment for a quick biblical lesson of, of this struggle of self-image. You don't have to turn there. I'll tell you the story. It's found in the book of Judges chapter 6. 
And uh, the children of Israel, let me give you a, a, a brief background of what's going on. The children of Israel are under the judgment of God and the Midianites have come and they're taking everything they can take from the children of Israel. When they grow a crop, the Midianites show up and steal the crop. When they herd their, their, their herds of whatever flocks they have, the Midianites take and steal from them. And so it's really gotten to a really terrible situation. And we find a young man by the name of Gideon. The Bible said when God finds him, he is in a wine press threshing wheat because he did not want the Midianites to know that he had any wheat to make bread with. And so he's hiding out threshing wheat. And the Bible paints this picture and it says that the angel of the Lord. Now when we see that in the Old Testament, many scholars believe that's the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. The, the angel of the Lord. Not an angel by name, but the angel of the Lord showed up and looked at this man who was in a wine press, afraid, terrified, scared to death and said, Hey, you mighty man of valor. You are a mighty warrior. Now what I want you to do, mighty warrior, is I want you to go in the might of my proclamation over your life and I want you to deliver your people. Oh, hallelujah. When God makes a proclamation over your life, I want you to understand you are capable of doing what he says you are capable of doing. He said you are a mighty man of valor. And now I want you to go and I want you to do this job in the power of my proclamation over your life because I'm looking at you as a warrior, as a mighty person of God. And, and here's what happens. Gideon says he reflects out of his identity. He said, I really can't do this. I'm from the poorest, smallest tribe of Israel and from that I am the least the lowest, the smallest among them he's saying when I see myself I am incapable because I'm coming from the wrong side of society I'm coming from a group of people that are the smallest they have no might, they have no power, they have no wherewithal to get the job done. Isn't it amazing how some of us carry scars from our family history because we'll look back and go, granddaddy was an alcoholic and daddy was an alcoholic and I guess I'll be an alcoholic. I got news for you. That's not how God sees you. So, so Gideon is, is, is saying I don't have the capacity. I'm weak. I, I, I'm not qualified. I'm from the wrong side of the tracks. I'm a nobody from nowhere, and therefore I can't do what you've asked me to do. But I want to tell you how God sees you is how you really are, and that's how the devil sees you. That's why he, that's why he continues to tell you that you have no value and no worth. You see, his, his um, reluctance to accept this identity came out of what he thought about himself. He focused on his weakness rather than his God. Can I say that again? When, when you have a low self-esteem, when you feel like you are incapable of doing what God has spoken over you, what God has declared about you, what God has destined you to be and become and do, you are focusing on your weakness and not the strength of God. That's why Paul said, I can do all things. I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Now, I may look in the mirror and feel weak and punny and scrawny and not able, but when God looks at me, he said, hey, you can do what I've called you. I've spoken a word over your life. Another quick example of this marred, ruined identity is 
when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and they're going through the desert and God said, I've got you, I, I've got something set up really good for you. I'm going to you know, go into the land of Canaan because in there is the land that flows with milk and honey and I'm going to give it all to you. It's yours. Hallelujah. All the promises of yet our God are yes and amen. All the promises of God. Listen to me. You may not get a lot out of this, but all the promises for you are yes and amen. That's a devil positive. Yes, yes, yes. Hello? Those are the promises of God. And so Moses said, you know what I need to do? I'm going to send a delegation of 12 spies into the land to check it out so we'll know exactly what we're going to do when we get there. And so they go over there, they check it out, and 10 of them come back. There are 12. 10 of them come back, and, and 10 of the 12 say, hey, this is really the land that flows with milk and honey. It's just like you described it. Man, there are grapes so large that it takes two of us to carry a cluster. I'm, I'm, really, it is a most marvelous, uh, wonderful, wonderful promise we've ever seen, but... You'd be so proud of what I don't say on Sunday morning. All right, I will. There are a lot of buts. Hello? But there are giants in the land. And the more they talk about the largeness of the giants, the smaller they become in their own eyes. And they said, we're, we're, we're insignificant. We're small. As a matter of fact, they're giants and we're grasshoppers. They're giants and we're grasshoppers. Can I tell you, God doesn't need any more grasshoppers. God doesn't need any more people with small thinking. God needs someone like Caleb and Joshua who stand up and say, yeah, they big, but our God is bigger. Yeah, there's a problem, but our God is able to get us through. We are well able to walk in and take the promise of God and make it ours. Let's do it, baby. Let's get on with it. Yeah. Hallelujah. You see, wrong identity produces the grasshopper syndrome in your life. And as long as the devil can convince you that you are a grasshopper, you will never be a champion. But that's not the only problem with identity. There are some real identity thieves. Someone has stolen your identity by placing a label on you. Other people, systems, circumstances have influenced your estimation of your value. You may have been rejected. There may have been a broken relationship. There might have been a failure, a financial problem, a setback. And now you've been labeled and someone stole your identity. Can I give you three quick biblical examples? Do you remember in John chapter 4, there's this woman who goes to the well? I, I preached uh, probably one of my first or second sermons about that here. She goes to the well. She goes there because literally she had a little problem with men. Are, are y'all are even paying it? Yeah. You see, she went there when nobody else went there because she had this reputation and uh, she had a past. And when Jesus showed up, he said, woman, give me a, uh, you know, some water. And you know the whole story. Um, she, she wants to talk about religion and he wants to talk about her relationships. And so he says to her, go get your husband. I don't have a husband. That's a great answer. He said, you've had five and the guy you got now don't even belong to you. Now, interesting enough, we never know her name. All we know is her past. And what happens if we're not careful, we'll label someone because of their past. And if we're not careful, we'll let someone label us because of our past. 
But I want to tell you what she became. She may have been an immoral woman with five husbands and the one she had wasn't hers, but she was the first woman evangelist in the New Testament. The Bible says that she left her water pot, she left what she thought was valuable, and she went into the city and she began to speak and tell all that she had ever done and that she had met a man by the name of Jesus and he was the Messiah. He was the one who turned her life around. You see, you can be labeled by your past, but don't let someone steal who you really are by labeling you by your past. Let's move on to John chapter 5. There's a guy who's laying in a mat, laying at the pool of Bethesda. We never know his name. Jesus shows up and said, you want to be well? And he begins to say, you know, I really do, but you know what? No one ever helps me. I don't get in the water quick enough, da-da-da-da-da. You know, the problem is greater than my possibility. Hello, hello, hello. If we were going to label him, we would label him as a person who had a problem. Are you, see, are you hearing what I'm saying? His real identity is never known. He's just labeled. Because I'll tell you how I know he was labeled. Because when he got healed and he walked out of that place, they said, aren't you the guy who's been laying on the mat? Aren't you the man on the mat? Aren't you the guy that we identify with a problem? You may have had a problem, friend, but don't let that problem define who you are. Don't let that problem identify you as who you are. Don't let that situation make you feel like you are not what God wants you to be. I want to tell you, he was the man on the mat, and he walked out with a testimony. He's no longer the guy with a problem. He's the guy with the testimony. There are identity stealers. The woman had a past. He had a problem. And then we go on. A few chapters more in John. And there's this story. The, the devil hates Jesus and he hates everybody associated with Jesus. And so there are people that are trying to trip up Jesus. And so I don't know how they did this. It was, I'm sure it was a planned, coerced moment. They snatched a woman right out of the sheets of adultery drug her in embarrassment to Jesus Christ. And they said to him, the law says, now listen to the label, she is an adulterer. We're labeling her. She's an adulterer. Let's kill her. If we were killed for our mistakes, there wouldn't be none of us here today. Well, I might be preaching to empty pews. I don't know. No. <laughs> You're the adulterer. We're defining you. We're identifying you by your mistake. I love what Jesus did. Jesus just got down and started doodling. You know when you ignore people, they get really angry. What do you say, Rabbi? I think he just started writing the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not. You think we should kill her? That's what Moses said. She made a mistake. It's horrendous. It's wrong. Please, please, please hear what I'm saying. Jesus kept doodling. We want an answer. We demand, we demand an answer. We've labeled this person. We want to know what you think of her. Jesus stood up and said, you that are without sin, you throw the first stone. You're really good at labeling people, and you're really good at wanting to kill them. But if you have no sin, you've never made a mistake, go ahead and throw a stone. Can I tell you, don't let anybody label you over a mistake. Do what Jesus said to do. Don't do this anymore. Go and sin no more. I'm not condemning you. I'm freeing you. 
I'm not, con- listen to me. You may have made a mistake. You may be sitting in the pew this morning. You may be listening. And let me tell you what. You may have made a bunch of mistakes. But I'm going to tell you, don't let that identify you as who you are. Don't you get your self-worth or self-identity out of that mistake. You rise up just like that woman did and go, okay, I'm not being condemned. I'm being forgiven. And I'm going to walk away from here. I'm not going to make that mistake again. And that's not my identity. That's not who I am. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Why, why do I bring those kind of a things to your attention? It's so that you understand that God knows who we are. God is the one who places a value on our life. Don't let anyone else label you. You, you may have seen this illustration before, but I got this, I got this $20 bill here. How, how much is it worth? It's not a trick question. <laughs> I don't want the inflationary rate of a $20 bill. How much is it worth? What's the face value? Three out of four still don't know. <clears throat> How much is this worth? $20. Why? Because the government who has the authority to establish the value on a printed piece of paper has, a, has said this is worth $20. It is manufactured. The image has been created by the person who has the authority to state that the identity of this piece of paper is worth $20. Who wants it? You do, okay. It's yours. Why did you want that? It was all, but, but it's worth, it's worth $20. That's really yours. I'm going to take it out of the offering, but it's yours. <laughs> Pam, remind me to get a reimbursement. <laughs> that, that, that was a pretty, that was a pretty good looking $20 bill, wasn't it? I mean, really, it was, it was, it was pretty crisp. I got it right out of my pocket this morning. I got another piece of paper. This one's not really crisp. It's been written on. It's been wadded up. It's probably been places that I really don't want to know about. What's the value? Oh, it's, it's got the same picture on it as her nice, crisp $20 bill. It's all beat up. How, how many want this beat up? Why, why did you want that? It was beat up. It was marred. It was marked up. It's probably been some places that you really don't want it to be, but why do you want it? Because it still has the value. The the one who had the power to esteem the value of that piece of paper said it's worth $20. It doesn't matter if it's wadded up, crumbled up. doesn't matter if it had frayed edges, torn up, marked on. It's still, what I'm trying to get at is God, 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 God has already determined your value. It doesn't matter if you've been beat up. It doesn't matter if you made a mistake. It doesn't matter if you've had some hard knocks. You are valuable to the living. Living God, I want to shout hallelujah. Where, where, where do we get? Now listen to me, there really is, there, there, there are young people who are going through such identity crisis. I mean, our government is so mixed up, they, they don't even know which bathroom to go to. We're, we're, we're in a crisis. It's serious. Where in this avalanche of misinformation Do we get our identity, Pastor? If I look in the mirror, quite honestly, the greatest love of all is not loving yourself. 
Because most of us cannot find enough to love ourselves over. Because once we take off the mask, we know. Where do we get our identity? I love what Ephesians 2.10 says. We are his workmanship. One translation said his handiwork. Another says his masterpiece. My true identity does not come from the misinformation of the age. My true identity comes from Christ Jesus. I want to give you a couple things. First of all, you, according to Ephesians 2.10, are a, the word workmanship there or masterpiece there means that you are a work in process. And you are a work in progress. Not only is God working on you and in you, but God is going to mold and shape you just as he wants you to be. And so secondly, you've got to see yourself as God sees you. My greatest struggle is not what I see in God. God is awesome. God is powerful. God is loving. God is impotent. God is infinite. That's not my struggle. I know that about God. My greatest struggle in life is what God knows about me and what God sees in me. And I want to tell you this morning, you can walk out of this place. It doesn't matter if your parents told you were a mistake. That is a lie that came out of the pit of hell. You are not not a mistake. You are not there are no babies that are a mistake. I want you to hear what I'm saying. You are not a mistake. You have been woven. The Bible said David talked about it. He said when I was in my mother's womb I was fearfully and wonderfully made. No wonder the devil hates babies. No wonder he wants to abort babies because God even on the inside of your mother when that sperm and that egg met all of a sudden there was an explosion of life and God said I'm creating you I'm working on you I'm making you are not a mistake baby what you've got to do is you've got to you've got to see yourself you've got to see yourself as God sees you How does God see me? Well, the only way I can really define that is I've got to believe that I am what God says I am. I am what God says I am. I am God's child. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. I am a friend of God, John 15 and 15. I am a member of the glorified church, 1 Corinthians 12, 20. I am a citizen of heaven in Philippians chapter 3. I am God's workmanship, his masterpiece in Ephesians 2, 10. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am a minister of God a partner with God Almighty. I am justified and I am righteous, Romans 5 and 5. I am secure in the hand of Almighty God. I am not insecure. I am not insufficient. I am secure. I have self-worth because of God. I am free from condemnation. The law of sin cannot rule over me. I am what God says I am. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am the apple of his eye. I have been chosen by God. I am known by God. I am complete in him. I don't need nothing outside of him because I'm complete in him. I am victorious. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am the redeemed of God. I am blessed by God and I am more than a conqueror. I am I wish you would help me this morning. Say with me, I am am. what God says. says. I am. am. Stand with me and say that. I am am. what God God. says I am. 